So I've been interviewing influential people in our community for the past few months, and this month's guest speaker is a certified coach, health and wellness coach, fitness group instructor, re-entry program creator, coordinator, and facilitator, peer coach, mentor, and leader. I can hear you giggling. He is also my greatest inspiration, a huge inspiration for strong prison lives and families, and the reason why I'm always smiling. I'm delighted to introduce this month's guest speaker, my amazing other half, Adam Clausen. So why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your story? Wow, that was a, a very, very flattering introduction. Uh, uh, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I come from uh, a single parent household. It was just my mother and I while I was growing up. Moved from the Midwest out to the East Coast. It was a tough transition for me as a kid, but thankfully I I played sports and I did pretty well with that. And uh, that, that pretty much helped me out in school, you know, making friends. And uh, it got me into high school. It got me into a, a pretty good high school where the expectation was just always for me to finish high school, go off to college, and, and kind of figure it out from there. Unfortunately, I never made it that far. At the end of my junior year in high school, I was asked to leave and not come back for my senior year, which in itself was a pretty traumatic experience. And I, I wound up getting caught up running with you know, the wrong group of friends, uh, was out in the streets and wound up living in hotels, motels, committed a string of burglaries and robberies that kept me from ever graduating. I uh, never made it to my senior prom, my graduation. I wound up in prison instead. Uh, it was in prison that you know, I, I discovered drugs and, and a number of other bad habits and made some bad associations that, <laughs> you know, contributed to uh, all the negative things that, that I had been involved in prior to prison. How old were you at the time? Uh, was it juvenile or was it, how old were you? Were you convicted as an adult? I, it just turned 18 years old. I was still in high school. Okay. Uh, I, I should have been a senior in high school. So that that was a time period. You know, I was just a kid, uh, really didn't have any direction. And being in prison, I was exposed to a lot of different things, and they weren't all negative. I was able to take a couple of, like, behavior modification programs. I got my GED, took a number of vocational trades. I really enjoyed getting into, uh, like, carpentry, woodworking, uh, got a little experience in welding. Uh, I acquired all those skills during that time, but by the time I left prison three and a half years later, I still had no plan. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Uh, thankfully, I had a job waiting through some family friends working in construction. I uh, I just didn't see any, any opportunity, any future uh, in that field for me. But at the same time, at 21 years old, I felt like all my other friends, everyone else I had grown up with, they were they were finishing college, you know, starting careers, starting, uh, you know, to move forward in their lives. And, and I felt like I got left behind. Since nobody in my family or none of my friends, nobody had ever been in prison, I really didn't have any guidance, nobody to tell me or, or, or give me any advice on, on how to proceed there. I had a couple of people tell me, you know, hey, man, you know, you should go back to school. But it seemed like such a huge step backwards. I, I, I couldn't imagine, as they were graduating, me going back and just starting over. That's what it felt like. So instead, uh, I wound up catching up with some of my old associations and who were all too eager to help me uh, get right into the drug trade that they were in. And to be honest, it was, I'd been out of prison maybe 90 days, you know, a few months, and I had already committed my first drug sale and was completely caught up in a whole different lifestyle. So what was that? You, did that you for about, created a what? A drug sale? Yeah, I committed, uh, uh, got into selling drugs, 
the guys that I had grown up with who had who had gone into that line of work, uh, <laughs> you know, were were pretty eager to to help me get set up and get on my feet coming home from prison. And I saw it as an opportunity maybe to, to jump ahead, you know, to at least get myself established, uh, get some of the things that I wanted. Uh, and I did that for two years, to be honest. I was out pretty much every night of the week, you know, partying, selling drugs, uh, acquiring some things here and there. Uh, but it was a really unfulfilling, unhappy meaningless existence that left me totally drained. Eventually, uh, my parole officer wound up violating me, uh, tested positive on a urine analysis. They put me in the county jail, came to county jail, one of the most unpleasant places on the planet. It still didn't, didn't address any of the issues that I was having at that time. Uh, actually it made things much, much worse because by the time I got out, I had lost my phone, my car, my home, uh, and a good portion of my possessions. Uh, you know, the people I entrusted to look for. call is from a federal prison. That I had entrusted to look out for those things. Uh, really didn't, didn't do anything for me while I was away, and even though I was only in there for a few months, you know, it was my birthday, it was Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's 2000, change of, you know, the millennium. Uh, and I sat there in the county jail, and by the time I got out, they, they let me walk out. I literally walked out in a t-shirt, pair of sneakers, no money in my pocket. I had a bill for the cost of my incarceration that they expected me to pay at that point, despite having just lost all that stuff. So it was, it was a pretty desperate state uh, that I was in, and it's like so many other guys. I mean, that's you're getting out of prison, and, and you really, what do you have to fall back on? Uh, and it didn't feel like anybody really understood what I was going through. Uh, you know, it was a foreign experience. Nobody else had, had been caught up in this, except for those people, uh, guys that I had done time with in the state prison, who were there to uh, pick me up, uh, help me get back on my feet. And the means of doing that was actually uh, setting up a string of robberies that ultimately led to this time right here that I received. Uh, I got a string of robberies and extortions uh, that occurred over the course of one month. One month, it was the time between when I got out from that parole violation uh, leading up to I would have completed my parole the week after I was arrested. So I was one week short of completing my parole and being able to, to leave the state and, and not have any of those, you know, ties, uh, anything holding me back. Uh, but I never made it that far. I wound up getting uh, picked up literally in the shadow of City Hall in downtown Philadelphia. Myself and my co-defendants were all arrested together. And those guys that I had uh, that I had met in the state prison uh, who were there with me, they were all too eager to, uh, you know, to cooperate with with the feds and the federal authorities and pin the blame on myself and my other co-defendants, and uh, that's where all this time came from. This time that I now have is the result of me making a, a conscious decision not to uh, to continue that that chain of events, not to turn around and and try and uh, you know to work with the feds to to give someone else the time that I ended up receiving receiving. So how much, you know, for that, people that, that don't know, how much time is all this time? All this time. Well, for, for the underlying crimes, for the robberies that I committed over that one month period, uh, I was 
open to a um, the sentencing range was 97 to 110 months, which is uh, basically eight to nine years. And that's what I received. I got 97 months, but uh, because I would not cooperate with the with the U.S. attorneys and the, and the FBI agents, they decided to additionally charge me with a firearm offense that carries an extra 25 additional years each time a firearm was used. So I got that, that 97 months, the eight years, plus an additional 205 years uh, for using a firearm, for having a, a, a weapon on me during those, while those crimes were committed. Okay, so what year was what year did you go in? What year did this all start? This all happened in the very beginning of 2000 in February, you know, uh, February 2000, 15 years ago. Okay, and what about? Do you have any um, appeals or anything like that? Uh, what a lot of people don't know that they're unaware of is when Bill Clinton was in office. He passed what's called the AEDPA, and what that put into put into action was a streamlined course of appeals, meaning that each person who comes through federal court gets one set of appeals. Prior to that, uh, Guys were able to repeatedly file appeal after appeal after appeal, and sometimes they'd get lucky. When Bill Clinton passed that, it eliminated multiple appeals. You get one set of appeals. If you are unsuccessful at the completion of those appeals, then your only recourse becomes a presidential pardon or commutation of sentence. My final appeal was exhausted back in 2005, roughly 10 years ago. Okay, well, what about parole? Uh, that's the other thing. The federal system no longer has parole. Um, it's been discussed a couple of times, and it, it would obviously be a good idea for individuals such as myself and others serving lengthy or life sentences to create some sort of incentive for guys to maintain good conduct productive while they're in prison, but currently it doesn't exist. Okay, so you got arrested at 18, you did three years, you got out, and then you met up with the wrong crowd and you went back in. So that was, you said, 2000? Yeah, I was arrested on, on this charge in uh, February of 2000. Okay, so, so what's been going on? Sorry, go ahead. No, you got it. What's been going on with you since 2000? You've been there for a while. Since February of 2000, I've, I've been in federal custody, and I spent the first 10 years of my incarceration. Let's call it from a federal prison. Really? exploring a, a passion that I found for health and fitness. And I was fortunate to have an opportunity at the first facility that I was in to begin teaching a, a fitness class there. And everything that I was learning, I was able to put it into practice. So I had a, I had a real unique opportunity to, to have so many different guys uh, come through and allow me the chance to work with these guys and, and really develop that passion. I did that for about 10 years, and, and eventually I worked my way down from uh, USP, from a penitentiary, maximum security, down to a medium, which is where I'm at now. And after coming to the medium security, uh, there wasn't the same opportunity to pursue those classes in, in health and fitness that I was instructing. So I took a little time to myself to to really figure out, you know, uh, if that was what I wanted to do, if there was something more, explore my options. And I was lucky enough to, to be invited to participate in a life coaching class that was 
is started by an associate warden here at this facility. Through that life coaching course, uh, a number of other opportunities arose that led to a certification a couple years later as a certified life coach that I was also able to implement in everything that I'm doing with health and fitness. Uh, so it, it really expanded. It allowed me to work in, with my passion and to help a lot more people and, and to share that with them. Yeah, I'm not really keen on that whole answer, but go ahead. Ask me another question. Well, also, I love that you brought that up because in my premium section, I made a video the other day about, because I always talk about myself being into uh, health and wellness, and I made a video about how, you know, you were into it, I was into it, but we didn't get each other into it, but it's a mutual thing that we both, it's a mutual love that we both have, and also it's something that we both use kind of to cope to get through this. But one of my favorite stories that you always tell is what happened on September 1st, 2001. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? On September 11th? I'm sorry, yeah. I was all distracted yeah. about health and wellness. <laughs> I can't remember the right date. Yeah. Wow, September 11th. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Uh, I was definitely at a different place. That was early on, uh, shortly after I was sentenced. And a lot of the bad habits that I had, you know, prior to prior to my arrest carried over for those first couple of years that I was in prison. But September 11th was a wake-up call for me. Uh, I woke up in segregation in the hole. Uh, all alone, uh, no clothes, no covers, no nothing in a bare cell, uh, hungover from the, from the previous day and really had no idea what was going on. Didn't know what time of day it was. Didn't, didn't know anything. I was in the end cell on, on the tier. So it was difficult to, to really communicate with anybody else on that tier, but I went over to the vent, and there was a couple guys in, in the cell next to me who happened to be on my block. They had gotten into a into a fight there on the unit. It was part of actually part of a riot, and they were back there in the cell together. And, and I'm yelling through the vent to them, trying to get a book because I have nothing in my cell. And, and uh, at this point, I'll take anything, anything to keep my mind busy and really not focus on how miserable I am to be sitting in the cell alone. And the guy's yelling back through the vent. I can't hear him real well. And he's talking about, yeah, World Trade Centers and and planes flying and bombs. And, and I'm like, yeah, 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 that sounds like a great book. Send that, send that book over. I want to read that. <laughs> Never realizing that, you know, that wasn't a story. It was actually happening that day. And... Somehow the word had been passed. They had heard about it. Even back there in the hole, guys knew what was going on. A little bit later that day, uh, I got moved to another cell all the way up in the in the front of that unit. And I'm in there with another guy who, who filled me in. He had a radio, and he had heard about it on the news. And I was just in awe. I, I couldn't believe it. And up to that point, you know, I felt like, I guess I felt like, my country, the government, they had all betrayed me, you know. I'm sitting in prison with a life sentence, in segregation. And in that moment when I when I realized what had happened, I also realized that I was deeply patriotic. And that really surprised me because that wasn't something that, that wasn't how I ever viewed myself as, as really being patriotic, you know. Um, parades and all that on, you know, the 4th of July and holidays, like, none of that. It never really resonated with me. But September 11th did. And on a more personal level, not only did I realize that I was patriotic, I, I realized that I was in a position where I was completely helpless. You know, I was cut off from the outside world. I wasn't in touch with hardly any members of my family, friends, Everyone was still uh, in shock from the investigation, the trial, the time that I received. You know, people were scared to have contact with me because, uh, you know, they received threats from the government. And uh, 
and they were still in shock. So I felt like I was totally disconnected. But at the same time, uh, I don't know, it, it inspired a, a certain sense of, of hope and patriotism in me, and uh, I, I made a conscious decision at that point that I wasn't going to end up back there anymore, that I wasn't going to be as cut off from the outside world, that I was going to start doing more to reconnect. Let's call it from a federal prison. To stop putting myself in such a bad predicament. It seemed like I had done quite a bit of that, enough of it. And when I had reached that point, I had reached a point where I just had enough. So was it a black and white change? No, it wasn't. It wasn't an immediate change that took place. That was basically like a, a, a spark that just kind of ignited, ignited a fire that really just kind of smoldered for a while. Didn't really catch flame until a couple of years later, when I was really deep into the the health and fitness. Uh, you know, people always ask me how I got to to where I am today. And there's a few things that I can pinpoint. That day was one of them. But there was a number of events, you know, long after that day, you know, leading up up to the present that helped, helped move me along. Uh, what I would say was a, a huge influence on me was an individual who is, well, about 15 years older than I am. Uh, he's a lifer. And he was one of the guys that really tried to steer me in the right direction when I first got there to Allenwood. And eventually, he was the one that convinced me to to create my own class and to start that through rec. And that opened the door to all the other opportunities. And, and it was because of his influence, uh, because of his suggesting, his guidance, that I really... Uh, made the more substantial changes. Somewhat ironically, all these years later, when when I got here, he was already here. And he was the one who, again, helped me to make another major transition coming from the, the penitentiary down to the medium. Uh, because, to be honest, I, I, I struggled with this transition a lot more than I care to admit. Uh, I didn't think that it was going to be that big of a deal, but it was. Uh, my social skills were greatly handicapped after spending that much time in an environment that is so electric, potentially incendiary, you know, where you have to always be concerned about you know, what you say, what you do. and. There's a tension that's always in the air, and, and to come here to a place where none of that exists, uh, it's, it's very different. And thankfully, he was here to, to help me do that. And uh, I still look to him now for guidance. He's still uh, a positive influence, still a mentor. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. He's much of the reason why I do what I do now helping other guys to make the transition. My way to, to pass that along to others. I'm grateful that you shared that as well because not only did I get to experience you go through that, but also a lot of, you know, we're doing this interview to help these women and to get an inside perspective. And a lot of them worry about institutionalization and, you know, how is he going to, what's it going to be like when he either moves down or moves home. And I think that's, that's huge that they get to hear it kind of from the horse's mouth and somebody that went through it. Wow, did you just refer to me as a horse? I think I might have. <laughs> <laughs> You're Italian, though. Don't worry. <laughs> Way to clean that up. <laughs> All right. Anyway, okay, so getting more into helping the women. Okay, so we all know that long-distance relationships are difficult, but especially these type of relationships that exist, you know, that are separated by the prison walls. So what's the most difficult part of being the inside half of a prison relationship? And how do you work past those struggles to make our relationship thrive? Wow. Um, the loaded one. <laughs> this is like a confessional. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I honestly, I, 
the only difficult part of this is the actual physical separation. Um, and I see a lot of advantages to uh, to our situation. It's the first time in my life in, in any relationship with any friend, with any person, that I have ever had so much... Uh, just so much of an open dialogue. I mean, we talk about everything, and and most importantly, uh, full disclosure here. Uh, I had been horrible in every previous relationship I've been in. Um, you know, I just I was very immature. I was a kid, uh, and I wasn't good about being truthful about anything, and. You know, it's been I don't know how many years now. What are we talking about? Six years? Yep. And I have never once lied to you about anything, big or small. And I've never felt like I needed to. So for me, that's that's something that I never experienced before. Uh, And I think all that is the result of... Um, how our relationship has developed in here under these conditions. It's, it's, it's actually forced us to communicate better because that's the only way that it can work. The communication has to be there. With, without it, uh, you know, that opens, opens the door to all the negative stuff, all the, the, the worry, the fear, the, the jealousy, um, you know, we've, we've honestly, we've never had that, so. I agree, and it's it's really nice to hear that from a male perspective because on the site and, you know, all the women, we talk a lot, and we, we always say very similar things, but females are a lot more emotional by nature and a lot more um, open and communicative, so it's nice to hear that from your point of view as well because I think that will be the consolation that I think our community needs to hear. Let me let me add add this to it. Uh, all of us in here, every single one of us, is walking around with a ton of emotional baggage. Mm-hmm. We have a ton of emotional baggage from our past, uh, from the current situation that we're trying to cope with, from being away from family, friends, and like you, as you just said, you know, we as men don't. Don't often communicate very with college from a federal prison with our loved ones, and especially not with one another. So, being in here, just you know, with our peers, just around all men, doesn't really lend itself. Generally, doesn't lend itself to for us to be able, you know, to have a forum to express that. So, uh, that's one of the biggest challenges for us in here. And I know a lot of guys struggle with that. So. I love it. Okay, I really, <clears throat> I really wanted to get to this next question because I had a girl on Instagram the other day ask me this exact question after I wrote up these questions for this interview, and I responded and I was like, Oh my God, I have this interview coming up. Just wait until wait until next week or whenever it's up. So I'm gonna read it because it's kind of a long one. It says a common theme among our members is dealing with inmates who try to control their loved ones from the inside. They often irrationally accuse their partner of cheating, trying to dictate who they can see and where they can go, etc. I'm so blessed to be the minority as far as that's concerned. You've always been so wonderful at encouraging me to live my life while you're gone. Um, How are you able to arrive at the place that allows you to be so trusting? Why do you think that the controlling issue is so common among guys inside? And what advice do you have for our SPWF members who are in these types of relationships? Wow, that's a uh, that's a long question. Yeah. Um, all right, let me uh, let me kind of address that from from the start of picking up where I where I just left off about you know communication being so important. Uh, in here, we have a lot of time uh, to get stuck in our heads, and especially a lot of the things that. I'm going to speak from, from myself. A lot of the things that I did 
in my past relationships, you know, the cheating, the lying, all of those things that I no longer subscribe to are still a part of my past. And it's very easy to, if, you know, those, those are things that you've done in the past to be concerned that that is going to come back around and that, you know, you're going to wind up being on the receiving end of that. Uh, this is a very vulnerable position to be in. And if you've done wrong, I mean, consciously or, or subconsciously, I mean, there's some guilt involved in that. And that's going to manifest itself and it, it's going to come out in being accusatory. You know, uh, it's a guilty conscience. Whether or not they're, you know, you're still thinking that way or, 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 or have those inclinations. I mean, that's, it's irrelevant. You're, you're dealing with some past issues that just, you haven't had an opportunity to deal with them yet. And if, if you can't open up and talk about those things, you're going to have a lot of difficulty moving forward. So that, that's why I say, you know, it kind of goes back to, to that last question on, you know, what has allowed us to our relationship to thrive has been that communication. Uh, and I think it's important to, to keep that open. And that allows me to, to be at a place where I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older at this point. Uh, and I, I, prior to us uh, really getting into this relationship, I was able to, to get to a point where I was, for the first time in my life, comfortable to be completely independent. I know a lot of people think, you know, that they've they've had a state of independence. But few people have. I mean, at most times in our life, we're, you know, relying on somebody else and much more than, than we acknowledge. And I think you really need to be able to stand on your own two feet and know who you are and, and where you stand and what's important to you before you can really commit yourself to somebody else. Otherwise, you get so caught up in the other person that you tend to lose sight of who you are and what's important to you. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, you know, being in here is an opportunity for for guys to find themselves and sometimes the scary part is that, that you realize uh, you know that, that maybe you need to you know do some things different uh, what you were doing before wasn't working and, and to, to face those changes a lot of times that, that's scary I mean it's, there's a lot of fear involved and uh, you know when, when you're feeling fearful you have a tendency to, to act a little bit irrationally at times, and, uh, and that fear just comes out. I mean, you know, you have difficulty trusting. So it's one of those things you gotta got to be patient. you got to try and, you know, work on, on talking those things through. And uh, I'm, I'm just grateful that, that you and I have not had those issues. And, uh, and I think it just has to do with us being at a point in our life where we both really know what we want. Right. So, uh, I'm grateful we found it. I agree. And like you said earlier, you won't, weren't always like that. I, of course, wasn't always like this, too. I mean, we are a little bit older, and we've both had our fair share of craziness in the past. So I would think that, I mean, my advice to those women would be to, like you said, communicate and talk through it. And, I mean, if you have to walk away, you have to walk away. Would you agree? Would you disagree? Being from the yeah, inside, no, like... Uh, I, I think, as I said, you, you got to be at a point where, where you're healthy. Um, relationships aren't, you know... I've heard people say, uh, I like to ask, you know, how much do you think you should invest in a relationship? And to be honest, if it's anything less than 100% of yourself, you know, that's not really fair. Both sides, it should be 100%. It's not, it's not a 50-50 thing. You're not only putting half of yourself. It needs to be all of you. But in order to be able to do that, you got to be healthy and whole yourself. I agree. Yep. 
So another question that I get very often is from women who are struggling with trying to um, help support her loved one when he's going through a downtime or a wave of a depression. Um, so from your point of view, what's the best advice you can give for how she can comfort him while he's going through a downtime or maybe doesn't want to talk very much or, you know, kind of gets a little snippy with her? Uh, you know, just to reinforce, just reinforce that, that you're there uh, for him. And let him know, you know, that you understand going through a difficult time. Uh, yeah, I, I think I can recall times, you know, early on, you go through stages with this. I'd, I'd like to prefer to, to say it's an evolution, like over time you come to certain realizations but everybody starts out at the same place. And then it takes different events for you for you to, you know, mature and grow and uh hopefully you don't have to do long periods of time in here, but uh you know, I'm able to look back now and and see those times like for me the the most important thing when I was feeling kinda of down, uh and I felt like nobody understood. Like, I couldn't, anybody on the outside, like, you don't understand what I'm going through, why I'm feeling this way, so don't try and comfort me. Right. However, the most beneficial thing that I had was someone to say, that's all right, you know, I don't understand, but I'm still here for you. Just to know that that supports there, that means everything. Yeah, I love that. That's great advice. Um, okay, so I just want to take a step back and go back to your sentence. For a second, you were telling us about before about your 213 years. So what – I get this question very often, and I appreciate it so much. So um, I want to hear from the horse's mouth. What's one thing that everyone can do right now to help not only you, but the 3,000 other inmates? from a federal prison. The 3,000 other inmates who are unjustly, unjustly – I can't say it – unjustly sentenced under the 924C. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, there's about 3,000 of us, uh, that are all serving, you know, this, these ridiculous sentences, they just, they don't serve any true purpose of justice, uh, and, and really it's just, it's drawing awareness to it, it's drawing awareness to the situation because, like you said, so many people ask about it, it just doesn't seem real, everybody asks me, they're like, all right, who, who died, someone must have died in your case. I got that too. I get that question. You get that question too? Yeah. Like everybody just assumes that. You assume that something's missing. And there's not. It's just we need a little bit of common sense. We need people to take notice, to raise awareness. And the easiest way to do that right now is to have people sign, uh, you know, sign a petition that we are circulating. And there are people beginning to get behind it. There are members of Congress who are aware of it. It's been introduced in 2009, 2011, 2000. You know, we need to get this amendment passed so that they cannot stop these sentences. And I will uh, post the link to that petition under the video for anybody that's right. ready and willing and hopefully can just sign it for us. It would be greatly appreciated. And what about so how fun was that interview, you guys? Um, at least it was fun for me and for us to make. But unfortunately, it took us, we got cut off on the last one. It took us four calls to get through that and to record the whole thing. So we were out of minutes and out of time. So I'm just going to conclude the whole thing on my own. But um, we got cut off while we were saying that, um, you know, what we can do to help him as far as the 924C petition. So, um I will post the link below if you can sign it. It'll take five seconds of your time, and we would be eternally grateful because that's going to help us get a countdown, hopefully get a countdown like you guys have, and hopefully remedy this situation, this unjust situation, not only for him but for the 3,000 other people affected by it. If you guys have questions, comments, concerns, or any, or anything like that, just email me um, and let me know. And also, um, we wanted to end it with a little bit of a challenge for you guys um, so you guys can get something productive out of this. So our challenge to you is how can you communicate, since communication was such a common 
theme in this and he said it helped um our relationship thrive for him on the inside how can you communicate better in your relationship today what's one step that you can take to communicate better in your relationship today also, if you can just comment below and let me know what you guys thought, if you have any further questions, if you want us to continue this in the future, it's something that we can absolutely do. Like I said, he had fun doing it. I had fun doing it. Um, it's just something that we're going to have to plan in the future if we're going to keep it because you guys know how the phones are. So thank you so much for watching. Again, comment below. Uh, let us know how you're going to communicate. Uh, take the challenge and really importantly let us know what you thought if you want to see this again in the future if you have further questions that you want to hear from an inside opinion i'll see you girls in the next video keep staying strong keep loving strong and keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you but in the meantime make sure that you communicate 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 to keep your relationship strong and get yourself through bye The Strong Prison Wives and Families community is a group of extremely positive, supportive, caring, and loving people dedicated to helping one another through this journey. Go to www.strongprisonwives.com, leave a comment, and join in on the conversation now. Also, check out our blog section where you can read daily thoughts from fellow wives and family members. Hop into the action by posting comments or your own blogs too. If you want even more support from all over the world, plus inspirational stories and insights from a lifer's wife who's been doing this a long time that I only share in my private video section, go sign up now. Again, this is Ro, co-founder of Strong Prison Wives and Families. Keep staying strong, keep loving strong, and sharing your support with our community. Lots and lots of my love to you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the site.